Okay, um, good evening everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to see so many of you and in particular to see so many of you that are young people. Uh, so this, is, this creates already an exciting atmosphere here. I'm also very excited to uh, uh, be able to introduce today Frederick Eberhardt. Um, Frederick is coming um, from Caltech and Caltech is of course very well known for all this uh, technical, um, for being a university for te of technology, but at the same time, there's a department of um, humanities there, a division of humanities and social sciences, and um, Frederick is there, a uh, professor of philosophy. Uh, his CV also includes other uh, technical universities. Uh, he has received his master's um, from Carnegie Mellon, and actually, he receives his master's from the uh, Center of Automated Learning and Discovery, which, of course, today is called the Department of Machine Learning in Carnegie Mellon University, one of the most prominent um, places for machine learning. And he did also his PhD in Carnegie Mellon uh, University. Before going to Caltech, uh, he had postdoctoral studies at Berkeley, and he was also professor of philosophy at uh, neuroscience and psychology at the uh, University of uh, St. Louis. Um, I had the opportunity to first meet um, Frederick uh, at Caltech. I was visiting and then I was looking at the curriculum because I wanted to attend some classes. So I had the great pleasure to uh, attend a class of uh, Frederick together with undergraduates and, and, and feeling how stupid I am after all these years. <laughs> and, and I can reassure you that he does some great and very interesting computer science and math. But I guess today he has chosen to tell us uh, about Aristotle. I very much appreciate that. And I also appreciate the part of the zebra fish. So um, a very warm welcome. And we're looking forward to your talk. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I still uh, have terrified memories of you coming to my class because it was the first time around I was teaching that class and was not expecting anyone but undergrads there, so it was a little bit intimidating. Um, since then, the class has improved. It's an enormous pleasure and honor to be here because, in, a, in large part, the Collegium Helveticum has goals that are very dear to my heart in getting the humanities to talk to the sciences, to get engineers talking to the humanities, to somehow foster this type of integration and collaboration between the humanities and the sciences. It has been part of my career. It is part of what I do in my work. And uh, so in some sense at Caltech, I'm a little bit of the odd one out or, uh, in that I'm a philosopher who works with the sciences, who, scientists, who talks to the scientists. And so... Being here at the Collegium uh, uh, seems to be a place where that is also encouraged and fostered, and I have found this to be an enormously rewarding experience to have this type of dialogue. And so I hope to use the next 50 minutes or so uh, to give you a sense of the kind of work that we have done and uh, how this type of crosstalk between the humanities and um, uh, the sciences has worked. Now, of course, saying that I'm going to talk about everything from Aristotle to zebrafish is just a way of getting people in the door, but I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint almost on every front between Aristotle and the zebrafish, including the endpoints, but uh, at least some of these points I will touch on. Now, you will know that uh, um, if you work on the boundaries between disciplines, you often uh, are respected by neither of the two disciplines whose boundary you're sitting on. For the humanities, you're too technical, too formal. They uh, can't follow what is going on or claim that they're not interested in it. And for the technical side, you're too vague and uh, not formal enough. You're not precise enough. You don't do enough experiments, that sort of thing. So neither department is particularly fond of you. And in particular, when you work on causality, you're in a very sticky point because the kind of proposal that you might do to say that you're working on a causal discovery algorithm will be read as you're working on a casual discovery algorithm and um, the casual discovery turns into casual research and so trying to motivate why it is actually causality that we care about and that we uh, are not casual in what we do. I have in my meetings introduced a dress code now that we are business causal, not business casual. But um, 
more seriously, causality is a very um, iffy topic, uh, uh, both for the sciences and the humanities. So one of the most famous, uh, or among the most famous philosophers, Bertrand Russell, said about causality that all philosophers of every school imagine that causation is one of the fundamental axioms or postulates of science. Yet oddly enough, in advanced sciences such as gravitational astronomy, the word cause never appears. To me, it seems that the reason why physics has ceased to look for causes is that, in fact, there are no such things. The law of causality, I believe, like much that passes muster among philosophers, is a relic of a bygone age, surviving like the monarchy only because it is erroneously thought to not do any harm. Now, this is a philosopher talking about his own discipline, so this is not a good starting point to uh, work on causality. And uh, it is matched in the sciences by Carl Pearson, the famous statistician, who said, beyond such discarded fundamentals as matter and force lies still another fetish amidst the inscrutable arcana of modern science, namely the category of cause and effect. So we are up against some uh, hard-hitting uh, people here in trying to say that there might be something to causality. In fact, I think the skepticism of, and attitude as causality as a dirty word in, in, in scientific discussion has done an enormous harm uh, uh, towards scientific investigation of causal relations in that it has replaced causal talk with imposters or uh, other words that are supposed to capture the idea of causality but not mention it by name. Don't mention the word causality, but instead say the variables are linked, that a variable results in another variable changing, that one lowers or promotes, uh, one variable lowers or promotes the value of the other, it increases the probability, there are strong connections, and often statistical dependencies that are discovered are given a kind of causal gloss without committing to any type of causal interpretation of what has been shown. So it seems that the need for a discussion of causality in the sciences is certainly there, but if the discussion of causality is um, considered unscientific, then of course we end up with headlines like these, which then, um, admittedly, these are from uh, the scientific media rather than from scientific papers, but they build on scientific papers. Is I, I want to suggest to you that all of these titles are making a causal claim of some form or another, or are suggesting a kind of causal connection, but none of them actually want to commit to saying that there is a causal link. Now, of course, there is something to it to saying that it's difficult to infer causality, or, uh, um, uh, that, 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 that it's not so clear when we have a causal relation, but we want to make sure that we don't, instead of talking about causality, are imprecise or vague in the kinds of terms that we use. So um, I think part of the um, key problem that we're after when we're looking at uh, causal relations is a very simple distinction now, uh, uh, and it's the following, is that we use a barometer to predict the weather tomorrow. I know these days you, use your, you look at your phone to predict the weather, but in Switzerland I think one can still show a nice mechanical barometer uh, with a precise mechanism. So it's an extremely good predictor of the weather tomorrow, but of course we don't think that the barometer is a cause of the weather tomorrow. Instead, we think that, well, the causal relation that's at work here is that there's atmospheric pressure that is a cause of the barometer reading, and there's atmospheric pressure that might have causal influence on the weather tomorrow. So that is what accounts for the excellent prediction that a barometer provides us, but we want to distinguish this sort of uh, ability to predict from one where we intervene. Namely, if we intervene on the barometer needle, right, then we have no effect whatsoever on the weather tomorrow. And that's because the barometer is not a cause of the weather, but the barometer reading might well be a cause of whether I'm taking my umbrella with me. Right? So there's an important distinction that I think is crucial, or that I think crucially hinges on uh, causal ideas is that we want to distinguish just mere prediction from prediction under intervention. And so I've tried wiggling the barometer needle ever since I arrived in Zurich yesterday. And uh, what's the German word for us? My success has been durchwachsen. I think the weather today was uh, all over the place. It didn't work as a cause of the weather. So capturing this sort of um, distinction between 
uh, mere correlation due to common causes and the kind of correlation that can be sustained under intervention, I think, is what we want to capture in terms of uh, discussing causality. So, in many disciplines, I think, actually, uh, despite what Carl Pearson and uh, Bertrand Russell said, I think that understanding the causal relations within a system is uh, the ultimate goal of the scientific research. I don't think that's true for all disciplines, but I think in many scientific disciplines that's the case. Um, that causal understanding is absolutely essential to predicting what the effects are of interventions that we perform. So without a, a clear understanding of causality, uh, we can't do that. And then um, you might say, well, this is a problem for the humanities or for legal scholars or something like that. I, don't, I wouldn't draw that separation quite so sharply, but I think causa causality or an understanding of causation also underlies our attribution of uh, blame and responsibility. All of these, I think, suggest that we should really make an effort to have a very clear account of causality and to uh, understand what's going on. Okay, the standard mantra is that correlation does not imply causation. Fine, that's, that's very straightforward. But then, of course, one can ask, what is it that does imply causation? Is there something that we can look for that gives us an indication that we're actually looking at a causal connection? Causality, unlike uh, various statistical properties of data, is not something that you can just read off from the data. It's not like a correlation that you can, you can compute, but it has to be inferred. And against the standard view that uh, perhaps the randomized controlled trial or some type of experiment is the gold standard for causality, I want to suggest that even in the case of experimental data, it's not, th not that we can read off whether we have a causal relation, but crucially that it has to be inferred there as well. And I want to give you just a very simple example from a case in uh, California where they found that uh, class size uh, in schools seemed to correlate with learning outcomes. And the thought was that perhaps smaller class sizes are good for or improve the learning outcomes. Now, of course, then, when, if, if there is indeed such a causal relation, then it would be very reasonable to say that, well, uh, let's intervene on class size and reduce class size, class size to improve our learning outcomes. That, well, that is what was done, and so an enormous number of teachers were hired. But unfortunately, this intervention also had side effects, you might say, is that as the hiring of teachers uh, took... Uh, um, uh, was started, they were hiring so many teachers that they were not only hiring good teachers, but also teachers who were no longer so good. And so the intervention that was supposed to be an intervention on class size is also an intervention, or was in that case, an intervention on teaching quality, which then had a detrimental effect on learning outcomes. So my point there is only that what you're, what you're assuming, of course, in hoping that you can identify the causal relation between class size and learning outcomes by intervention is that you're not also at the same time opening some type of other path that might be counteracting uh, the causal effect that's going on there. For example, you might then wonder in the end whether class size is really a cause of teaching quality and that is the cause of learning outcomes or whether there are different causal relations. In all cases, I think... Uh, the idea that somehow experiments are the gold standard for inferring causality is a very strong one. And remember that in experimental settings, you not only have the uh, uh, difficulty of ecological validity, but you also in general have far uh, fewer samples. So that then would suggest to me is that let's think about whether we have similar kinds of assumptions or uh, background knowledge that we can use to perhaps also uh, draw causal inferences in non-experimental settings. Okay, if causality is something that is inferred from data rather than somehow read off from data, then we obviously have to ask ourselves, how do we infer causality from data? And at that point, it seems like, well, if you're going to ask me how to infer causality from data, we have to ask ourselves, what is causality in the first place? So here it might be then tempting to look for definitions. And this is where... I think it's widely agreed that while Aristotle was certainly not the first to talk about causation, uh, many others had discussed causation, Aristotle is widely seen as having provided the first theoretical account of causation to provide a, somewhat of a framework of causation. And Aristotle uh, thought there were four different types of causes, the material cause, the formal cause, the efficient cause, and the final cause. And 
the thought of these different types of causes is often illustrated with the example of a statue, is that the material cause is that what the statue is made out of, the stone. The formal cause is the blueprint that you're uh, trying to um, uh, uh, make the statue, uh, like what, what that describes the statue. And then the efficient cause is what we perhaps now, uh, nowadays would call a cause, namely that is the, the artist who actually carves the stone. And the final cause is somehow the goal or the, the, in the, the purpose that the statue is supposed to take in the end, namely, for example, to honor a person or to make a square or a house look pretty. So if, you, if you're looking for definitions for causes, you can start with these and the kind of cause, that, as I suggested, that I think is of most interest to us is the efficient cause. But if you take this as the definition of a cause, then of course you have to ask yourself, in what sense is this a definition of a cause where you say, a cause is the primary source of the change. Now tell me how you're going to make sense of source of a change without referring back to causality in the first place. It's not clear that you've really provided a definition in terms of simpler terms, but you've rather reduced a problem to one previously unsolved. So it's not... I, I, I don't think, and I think to some extent that's perhaps what uh, uh, Russell was complaining about with regard to philosophy, is that it's very nice to describe causes in different terms, but this is not something that is going to give us a tool to do causal inference with. It doesn't get better if we jump to the 18th century with Hume's constant conjunction. He, he's, uh, Hume is famously known for saying that it's unclear uh, how we have any justification to infer causality from the observations that we have. And he says, we may define cause to be an object followed by another, and where all objects similar to the first are followed by objects similar to the second. But if you think about that even just for a minute, then you'll realize that at best this is a sufficient, uh, sorry, a necessary condition uh, for a cause, because even the simple example with a barometer in the storm is going to be a counterexample to this notion of a cause, because the barometer reading precedes the storm. Um, for the sake of argument, we can have that the barometer reading always precisely precedes the storm in the sense that for the same reading, you always get the same weather the next day. But in no case are we going to say that's sufficient to say that the barometer reading is a cause of the storm. So Hume's definition, again, not only has counterexamples, but also is not going to be a term, not going to be a basis for uh, doing anything scientific that will help us uh, study causality in the sciences. Unfortunately, and again, I think this is what, what uh, uh, Russell in, in significant degree is uh, referring to, it's, it has led to an enormous um, uh, zoo, you could say, of definitions of causality in um, philosophy. Uh, I say here definition three to what I take to be Latin for infinity, is that um, causation um, is defined not only in terms of counterfactuals, it's defined in terms of probabilities, it's sometimes defined in terms of a transfer of conserved quantities. You could, I don't want to go through all the details of each of these definitions, but in all of these cases, what I want to suggest to you is that there's a rich literature of counterexamples to these definitions, and in no case do these definitions provide us a kind of tool for the sciences. So then you might ask, is that, okay, maybe, maybe Russell is right, maybe... Pearson is right, maybe we don't have a definition for cause, and that's an indicator that there is no such thing as a cause, that it's not a well-defined scientific concept. I instead want to suggest a different view, is uh, one that goes back to Euclid, is that if you think about Euclid's axiomatization of geometry, then you've got five axioms, that between any two points you can draw a straight line, you can extend a straight line, uh, uh, infinitely. Um, if you have a line, then you, there's always a circle that you can draw with that line as its radius and uh, one of its endpoints end as the midpoint of the circle, that all right angles are congruent, and then the parallel postulate. Now, what do these axioms do to geometry? Now, importantly, what they don't do is define their primitive terms. There are an enormous number of primitive terms in these axioms, namely point, line, angle, intersection, all sorts of things, which are left undefined. Euclid doesn't give a specification of these terms. They are taken to be primitives in his axiomatization. Yet, the 
Axioms, of course, provide useful tools for doing geometry, and the axioms, as we know, are not all necessarily true. The fifth axiom, if you reject it, can lead to non-Euclidean geometry, and you can study uh, 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 geometry then in a different way. My suggestion then is, is to say that if you can axiomatize geometry, perhaps the way to think about causality is also in terms of an axiomatization. So rather than defining the trying to search for definitions for cause and effect or for a causal relation, try and instead find assumptions that seem reasonable to you and use those assumptions to provide a kind of framework that you can do inference with. So then the question is, what could an axiomatization of causality look like? Well, here is a rough suggestion um, of how we might think about this. So you might say, okay, one of the ways of thinking of causality is that um, if X is a cause of Y, then Y cannot be a cause of X. So there's an important asymmetry among, um, uh, uh, cause, among uh, between cause and effect. You might say, well, but we do have feedback uh, in some causal systems. Well, but then do you really have feedback between the same things, or are they delayed in time, uh, that, that, um, the, the kinds of things that you're talking about? Similarly, you might say, well, perhaps a reasonable axiom is one like the following, is that where I use this double turnstile as an um, indication of probability, the cross-type double turnstile as an indication of probabilistic dependence. So if you have prob a probabilistic dependence between X and Y, Either X causes Y, Y causes X, or there is some common cause, perhaps unmeasured, among X and Y. Perhaps that's an assumption that is reasonable to make. It, it's not exactly the same as saying uh, a correlation implies causation, but it says that, there's, that correlation can certainly be an indicator, or dependence can be an indicator of a causal relation. And similarly, then, you might think of the converse as saying if the two variables are completely independent of one another, then... Uh, we want to say that there's no causal relation between them. Again, these are assumptions that I think, like the parallel postulate, you might consider to be false in certain circumstances. Yet, if you accept them, then we might get a kind of framework that is useful to do causal inference in. Finally, then, you might say that the way to think about interventions on a causal system is that when you intervene on a variable, you make that variable independent of its normal causes, but you don't somehow destroy the system completely um, uh, or, or affect, this, uh, affect parts of the system that are far away. There might be many other axioms that you can consider, but what I want to suggest is that all of these assumptions are one that are quite common now in the literature on causality and are used quite widely, and they are not somehow used uniquely, is that uh, they are switched out and improved or weakened or strengthened depending on what uh, the kind of situation people are facing. So the first one is a simple acyclicity assumption about the causal system. The second one is a representation of the principle of common cause that goes back to the uh, philosopher Hans Reichenbach. The more general version these days in, in uh, causal inference is the causal Markov condition. The third one is what is known as the faithfulness condition. I won't dwell on that, but there are many weaker versions of that as well. And then the last one is what is known as surgical interventions, is that the intervention takes, you assume that the intervention takes full control of the variable that you're intervening on. Whether that's actually the case is, of course, then a question. And if you can't assume that, then you might want to change that sort of axiom. Okay, this is uh, the... These are the kinds of ideas, an axiomatic approach to causality that Judea Pearl, Peter Swirtes, Clark Limor, and Richard Chinas uh, pursued in developing this framework of causal graphical models. I think it's an extremely useful tool of think to think about causality because it combines different aspects that I think are essential to understanding causation. So in particular, it it puts constraints on, it, it represents the causal relations in terms of directed graphs, uh, like the one that I'm showing there. And it links these directed graphs to a probability distribution. So of that, that is to say, it links these graphs to what you would expect the data to look like if this is the underlying causal distribution. So in particular, you might expect for this causal model that I have on the left there, that W and X are actually independent of one another. Moreover, these, the causal graphical models framework ties together very tightly what you would think happens under 
observational conditions with what you think happens under interventional conditions. So in particular, in this case, if you intervene on Y, what you would expect for W and X to happen is that they would just take on the values that they would take on in the observational distribution anyway. And that is different from talking about the conditional distribution of W and X given Y. So let, let me just illustrate this point uh, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it. Suppose that W is whether your battery is filled and that X is whether uh, your gas tank uh, is filled and Y is whether the motor of your car starts. Now, in principle, or, or to start off with, you might say the, the level of the battery and the level of the gas tank are independent of one another. But if I tell you that my car doesn't start and I know that my gas tank is full, then you will have reasonable, uh, then it's a perfectly reasonable guess to say that, ah, probably your battery is empty. So you have a dependence conditional on Y between W and X. Now, in contrast, if I say that, well, I intervene to ensure that your motor doesn't start, and I now tell you your gas tank is full, what can you tell me about the battery? Not much. You would go back to the baseline probability of what you think the level of the battery is. So there's an important distinction between just conditioning on a variable probabilistically and intervening on that variable, and that's why uh, Judea Pearl introduced this do operator into the probability calculus that, that indicates this distinction between uh, conditioning and intervening. Okay, finally, this framework of causal graphical models also integrates uh, counterfactual reasoning. So, if we know that the variables take on a particular value, then we can ask the question is, well, what would Y have been if X had been zero? Now, this is the type of question that you ask to, when you're um, studying accidents or assigning blame and responsibility for an event. And importantly, I think that question is a different one from the question of what is Y if one intervenes to set X to zero? So, the difference between counterfactuals and interventional data is cleanly re represented in the causal graphical models framework, although I won't explain the details of the counterfactual case here. Overall, I then want to suggest to you is that the causal graphical models framework combines features of causality that I think are essential to explanation, namely observation, intervention, and counterfactual reasoning, and that in that way, it provides a very good framework to think about causal relations. So we can represent direct and indirect causal relations in the graph. We can talk about what happens when there's confounding. We can talk about what happens when there's unmeasured confounding. And we can capture the kind of notion that was so important to the statistician R.A. Fisher in that if you do a randomized controlled trial, one of the advantages of doing a randomized controlled trial is that you make the intervened variable independent of its causes, which implies that um, uh, you break the confounding in your estimate of the, causal, uh, of the causal effect, in this case, between wine drinking and heart disease. Now, moreover, the model, the, the, this type of uh, mathematical framework allows you to represent something that's called selection bias, is that if in my sample I only have elderly people, um, then I might have, due to my sample selection, introduced a dependence between wine drinking and heart disease that has nothing to do with the causal relation between uh, wine drinking and heart disease. Um, so overall, I think many of the crucial kinds of sources of dependencies that might give rise to spurious uh, uh, correlations in my data uh, can be explicitly represented in this sort of model. So then one might ask is that, okay, if we have a, the causal graphical model uh, framework as an account of causation, what is the notion of cause that is implied here? And so we now no longer have definitions of causation, but we can still characterize what it means to be a cause. So um, uh, Jim Woodward and Chris Hitchcock developed this uh, interventionist account of causation. It is not a definition of causation because it's non-reductive. It doesn't reduce the notion of causation to some sort of simpler notion, but it does connect important causal concepts to one another. So X on their story is a cause of Y if there is an intervention on X that changes Y or its probability distribution, while all other variables are held fixed by intervention. Now, that's not a definition of causation, certainly not a reductive one, because in order to give 
to, to describe what an intervention is, presumably you have to reach for causal concepts again. But nevertheless, I think it's a useful way of thinking about what sort of uh, um, uh, attributes we associate with a causal relation um, that is nicely captured by this sort of description. You don't have to take this description on board if you like the causal, causal graphical models framework because, for example, Dominic Jansing and Bernard Schulkopf from uh, Max Planck and Tubing took a different route and said the way we should understand causal, uh, uh, causal relations is that the causal generative process of a system's variables is composed of autonomous modules that do not inform or influence each other. Now again, this is not a definition because the notion of to inform or influence each other is of course hinges on causal notions, but nevertheless it provides a good idea of what we're actually talking about uh, in terms of um, this sort of more axiomatic framework of causality. Okay. Now, I, pro I was complaining about all the definitions that you couldn't actually work with them, so I had better offer a way of working with the causal graphical models framework. Here's the way, then, that I think about causal discovery um, within using this sort of framework, is that think of the underlying truth about how, what the causal relations are as unknown to us but representable in terms of these sorts of directed graphs. What we do observe as scientists are... Uh, uh, measurements of these underlying variables uh, in terms of the data that we obtain. And then what we want to do is we want to develop some sort of inference algorithm that takes this data and tells us what, sort of, what, what the underlying causal structure looks like. And in general, this sort of inference might not yield uniquely the true causal structure, but might only yield um, an equivalence class of causal structures. That is, given the assumptions that we're making, we cannot uniquely identify the causal structure, but we can at least constrain what sort of causal structures are candidates. And then there's a question of what sort of assumptions are going to be reasonable for any particular setting. And um, I think one of the advantages of the causal graphical models framework is that you can pick and choose your assumptions and try very strong assumptions and then start weakening them. And what we want to have in the inference algorithm then is something that shows that what we can prove about what can be discovered about the underlying causal structure given um, the assumptions that we're making and the data we have. Um, so I want to illustrate, just for those of you who have not seen this before, very, very briefly how this might work uh, in a very, very simple example. So here we just have three variables, x, y, and z, and for the sake of argument, I, or, or to make my point, I've drawn all the possible directed acyclic graphs over three variables here. There are 25 of them. Um, now, I made the assumption of acyclicity. In this case, we can argue about what would happen if I had dropped that assumption. But for this, to keep the problem simple, uh, I want to uh, uh, just work with this. Suppose that in my data, I discovered that x is independent of y, but that x is not independent of z and y is not independent of z. Okay, so these, this is something that I can just test with uh, an independence test. I don't have to use a parametric independence test. I could use a non-parametric independence test to establish these sorts of relations. And note that I'm not making any sort of assumption about time order here. I'm just uh, um, discovering an independence structure over these uh, three variables. Now, what might I infer from these sorts of, uh, from this independent structure. Well, if we start with x is independent of y, then we might say that it's very reasonable to assume that x and y have to be causally disconnected then. So there can, certainly cannot be an edge between x and y. That excludes already all the graphs in the bottom row. They all have a row, uh, an arrow between, a causal effect between x and y, and we would think that that would induce a dependence. So that's those graphs gone. Now, similarly for the ones here on the left, we have a causal relation between x and y. That seems like it would violate that x is independent of y, so I could exclude those as well. Similarly for the two up there, we have x and y causing each other. Uh, that also would be a violation of that x is independent of y. We don't generally think that causes and effects are independent of each other. Um, finally, the three graphs in the middle there also have a connection between x and y, so we can eliminate those as well. Now, the second statistic says that x is dependent on z, so 
if x and z are completely disconnected, that would seem like it's a violation of this sort of dependence. So if, uh, um, uh, if I therefore have to, uh, that allows me then to exclude those graphs where x and z are completely disconnected from one another. That's the two at the top, for example. Oh, well, it was also those two at the bottom, but also those two. Now, finally, y and z uh, are, independent, uh, are dependent on one another, so I don't want those two graphs at the top right because uh, they would violate that sort of assumption. I would expect, to, if those were the true causal graphs, I would expect in my data that y and z are independent of one another, but they're not, so those are also gone. Let's look at the empty graph. Would the empty graph be consistent with the relations that I find? Well, if the empty graph is the true is, is what is actually going on, that the three variables are causally completely disconnected from one another, then I think it's reasonable to think that uh, the variables would be completely independent of one another, but that's not what we find, so we can exclude that one too. That leaves us these four structures. I want to focus on the three here in the middle. If z is a common cause of x and y, that's what we standardly think of as confounding. Um, that would induce a dependence between x and y, which is not what we find in the data. And if x is an indirect cause of y, or y an indirect cause of x, I think we would also expect some sort of dependence between the variables. But that's not what we find. We, we discover that x is independent of y. Just from those three tests, we uniquely identified the causal graph. Now, you might say, did you have enough samples? Well, of course, I might have made mistakes in my independence tests. But the suggestion is that in the large sample limit, these three results, these three statistical results, would allow me, under the assumptions that I made, to uniquely identify the causal graph. And notice that I, I've, I've identified causal orientation too, namely that x is a cause of z and that y is a cause of z, but not that z is a cause of x and y. So, in some sense, this is a special case that uh, I've, I'm able from just such simple independent structure to recover uniquely the causal graph. But then we have to ask, well, what assumptions did I make? Here's the general uh, result, which is uh, now already uh, almost 30 years old, is that under the assumptions that there, is no, that there are no feedback cycles, that probabilistic independence implies the absence of causal connection, and that probabilistic dependence implies the presence of some causal connection, namely these are the Markov and faithfulness assumption, and that there are no unmeasured common causes. That means there's no unmeasured confounding, which, of course, in many settings you might not be willing to subscribe to. Then we know that no matter how many variables I have, that all the graphs that, I, uh, that are in the same equivalence class, that is, that I can't distinguish between them from just observational data, they have the same adjacencies and they have the same unshielded colliders. An unshielded collider is exactly this sort of structure that I have there where there's a common effect where the two parents are not connected causally to one another. This is a very strong result. I mean, in some sense, uh, this gives us a, an indication of just under relatively weak assumptions of what we can already discover for, about causal structure from purely observational data. I didn't assume time order. I didn't perform any experiments. And yet, uh, I can say something very specific about what sort of causal structures I'm able to identify and which ones not. So here are the equivalence classes among the causal structures over three variables where, given the assumptions that I made, I would not be able to distinguish within any of these equivalence classes. And so we had the graph over there on the left, uh, on, on your right, where, um, uh, which happens to be in its own equivalence class, so I can uniquely identify it. Um, and sometimes, if I have a very densely connected graph, I will not know exactly which graph it is, but I can tell you that it's in this class. The true graph is in that class, and then you have to either make stronger assumptions, or you're going to have to perform interventions to find out which one it is. Now, I gave you only a very, very simple example of how to do causal discovery. Of course, there are now an enormous number of methods that have been developed. Actually, several have been developed here at ETH um, that allow for causal discovery in time series data, that allow for causal discovery even if you have feedback cycles. 
When you have unmeasured confounding, that's perhaps one of the most important ones. There are several causal uh, inference algorithms that, that can handle unmeasured confounding. Of course, the equivalence class that you get in your output might be larger as a result of the weaker background assumptions. There are algorithms that integrate experimental and observational data and that can integrate background knowledge. And perhaps uh, uh, most interestingly, we now have algorithms that can really scale to large problems, to more than 100,000 variables. And on this last point is uh, what I want to show you. I want to show you an example of where we've tried to scale the causal inference to a really massive problem. For those interested, there are several places where you can get the code from, including uh, uh, several packages developed here at ETH uh, or the Center for Causal Discovery at the University of Pittsburgh, and many people have uh, more code on their own sites. Okay, the application that I want to discuss is zebrafish. So in many ways, being at Caltech, I've thought that we have really impressive measurement instruments in the sciences, and our data analysis is still quite mediocre. So it would be nice to have, you know, the data analysis equivalent of a gravitational wave detector or something like that. It's uh, somehow I don't quite know what to point to uh, for the data analysis equivalent of that. So one of the very impressive uh, uh, measurement techniques that I've come across is this light sheet mic microscopy that can be performed on zebrafish. Now for you know zebrafish maybe from your local aquarium shop. Uh, the, that's what they look like on the top right there. And in many ways, the uh, zebrafish are the drosophila of fish. Um, and uh, while I think there are many reasons why they are the, the um, scientific animal, one of those reasons is that in the larval state, they are translucent. So uh, you can look through them uh, uh, right there. And what's exciting about that is that means that you can actually image what's going on in their brains uh, using calcium indicators that fluoresce when the neurons are active. And so here we're looking at a... I guess you can't see it that well with the additional light. Um, you're looking at a brain of a zebrafish larvae, i.e. a brain that's in the very top part of... Uh, uh, the zebrafish larvae there, and it's fluorescing um, whenever the neurons are active. So the zebrafish larvae has about 80,000 neurons, and it's possible with this light sheet microscopy to basically measure every single one of them three times a second. And so it's an incredible feat of engineering, I think, to, that, that they're able to do that. And when I came across this, I thought this is, this, is, this is really exciting because finally we've got a vertebrate for which we can measure every single neuron in close to real time. The neurons fire a bit faster than we don't see the actual spikes. They go a bit faster uh, than the, uh, uh, the calcium indicator can keep up. But the calcium indicator is... Uh, not too bad. It's, it's, it has a, a delay of about uh, something like 200 milliseconds. So um, I started collaborating with people at Genelia, a lab where they, uh, a Misha Arendt's lab, where they have done a lot of, mic a lot of uh, light sheet microscopy of um, the brains of zebrafish um, uh, larvae. And I was interested in now whether we can infer the causal network of which neuron is talk talking to which other neuron among these 80,000 neurons in the zebrafish larvae. So our data looked something like this. On the left-hand side, you see the center of masses of each of the neurons that were measured. There are roughly 80,000 of them. And on the right-hand side, you see one data frame of what it looks like. Here we have the uh, zebrafish brain, and the color indicates how active the particular neuron is. Now, the way you should think about it is that when the data arrives on my end, I'm looking at um, basically a 3D movie of the activity of 80,000 neurons. And I'm interested in uh, discovering those connections uh, among them. So more, more specifically, the data looks like this. I don't know how well you can see that. But the... So this is a short snippet from a movie that we, const we constructed. The gray background indicates the location of, the, uh, um, of each of the individual neurons, and then the brightness uh, 
of the, the, of the neurons indicates its activity. Now, I'm only showing you slices here of the zebrafish brain. This is, in fact, a 3D uh, uh, movie. The, 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 that's the way you have to think about it. So now the question is, can we find which neuron is connected to which other neuron using these types of causal inference techniques over the, um, on this data? So if we go back to this type of picture of causal discovery, then what we're trying to do is the following. is We get the input data of what is actually happening in the uh, brain that is pre-processed to identify the uh, specific neurons and their activities, and we have about 7,000 volumes, full volumes of the brain, and uh, the brain is 80,000 of these neurons. Now, what we did is we spent about a year optimizing one of the causal inference algorithms to scale to this sort of problem uh, of learning a graphical model over 80,000 variables. And, of course, then you might ask, well, what sort of assumptions did you use? And here are some of the, well, well here are the important assumptions that we made is that we assumed there was no feedback, there were no, no, no unmeasured confounding, there was no time order in our data, so we, 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 because we were concerned of not actually tracking the spike trains, uh, we were concerned that um, the fluorescence uh, would destroy the specific time order that, uh, uh, of the spike trains. And we, because you're looking at a graph over 80,000 variables, we only could look at strong connections. So we had to make assumptions about, we, we had to leave out uh, a lot of connections. Now, are these assumptions reasonable? No. Uh, and of course we know that there's feedback between uh, different neurons in the zebrafish. And whether or not there are unmeasured latent variables is a very difficult thing to say because uh, in some sense we're measuring the whole brain, but of course there might be uh, uh, still common causes coming in from the outside or due to the measurement device uh, that is there. On the other hand, in some sense, this was the only option we had. We had to make very strong assumptions about this search problem because it was so enormous uh, to compute. So on the right-hand side, you see the kind of output we got. This is uh, um, a, an enormous number of lines connecting specific neurons. And if you, uh, when, when we first got these results, I shipped them to our colleagues at uh, Genelia, and they were thinking that I was doing a Rorschach test on them uh, rather than showing them any type of causal graph among uh, uh, the, the, the 80,000 neurons. Now, that's, that's often been my experience when we've done these types of causal inference tasks on problems where, in many cases, we just don't know yet what the causal relations are, and so we had to ask ourselves, well, uh, what can we do to establish that we have some that we have found anything at all here? So remember, we took this data as input without any kind of assumption of proximity of which neuron is uh, close to another one, and uh, we we tried to find the causal graph that was supposed to indicate the neural connections there. So we then looked at specific connections that are known. So here we pick out from that large graph uh, that we had before. We mapped the specific brain of that zebrafish uh, larvae onto a, a reference brain and then picked out the cerebellum and the inferior olive. So what you see here now are only all and only the connections that uh, were in the larger graph before uh, that are between the cerebellum and the inferior olive. And now, interestingly, uh, let me see whether I can get the pointer um, to work. So you see these crossover connections here from the inferior olive to, to the cerebellum, uh, which are rather surprising, um, uh, were, well, were completely surprising to us, but they were not surprising to the people at Genelia. That's, this is what they were hoping for. It's in a separate study that they had done uh, where they had lesioned the inferior olive, which is back here, they had lesioned it, um, they found that those results indicate that the inferior olive is necessary for successful adaptation of motor programs to external feedback in. One hypothesis is that an error signal is computed in the inferior olive via subtractive interaction of an efference copy of motor output and visual feedback from a swim bout, which then activates appropriate circuits in the cerebellum via climbing fibers. So our thought is that we, have, uh, we did the inference from purely functional data on, of the activation of the zebrafish um, neurons, uh, and then recovered neural connections for which there is ample evidence that they are actually there. And so the way to interpret these types of connections here is that 
there must be some type of specific direct connection between the inferior olive over here and this part of the cerebellum and vice versa for the other contralateral connections. Um, uh, of course, this might have been a fluke, but uh, we found this actually quite reliably among several fish that we analyzed. What, the background that you see here is the same in both cases, but that's just because it's a reference background. But the actual causal graph is from two, different, two completely different fish, and in both cases we find these types of crossover patterns. So I think we have some reason to, uh, to, to hope that the kinds of inference techniques, even with the rather strong assumptions that we've been making, are leading us to findings that are established or, or for which there's uh, um, uh, confidence in the uh, specific scientific domain. And now then the hope is that we can use this sort of whole-scale uh, um, view of the zebrafish to discover other connections which then could be tested by uh, uh, experts in the domain. We were very excited about it, and so um, uh, uh, this, is, this is work still that's in progress. But um, in many ways now we can start looking at, well, what if we drop the assumptions about uh, that there is no feedback? Can we perhaps, just by picking out these smaller regions, uh, confirm that we find, get these findings even with, under much weaker assumptions than, than we used for the initial computation, uh, which took about two weeks to compute in each case? Um, okay. Of course, if one studies, if one starts studying neural connections, then uh, certainly I got very excited about the fact, well, ultimately, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could do this on humans in some way? Now, we don't have measurements for every single neuron of the human brain, and we're still a long way off from that. But the um, approach in humans is that we think that not only are there causal connections at the micro level, that is, that, that, that the neurons are interacting with one another, but that we think that there is also a higher level description of the causal interactions that lead to behavior, so that mental states can be causes of um, uh, behavioral output. And so you might also think that, okay, if we get all the neural connections of the zebrafish, is there somehow a higher level description that... Uh, uh, you know, that one could ultimately think of a psychology of the zebrafish, or in the human at least, of a psychology of the human brain. So um, that leads to a question where I think there are still a lot of open problems that need to be solved, is that we think that neurons are cause, that the neural activity in a brain is the cause of behavior, and we think that mental states uh, are in many ways causes of the behavior. The uh, philosophers, if there are any philosophers among you here, then will recognize this problem as the exclusion problem from Jaeguan Quinn, Jaeguan Kim. Um, and the question is, are there multiple levels of causal description? And if so, how can we make those multiple levels consistent with one another? I want to use just two minutes to indicate to you one problem that arises in thinking of causal descriptions at multiple levels uh, and what we've done about it. Take as an example cholesterol as a cause of heart disease. If, if there are any medical people among you, please uh, excuse the, the inaccuracy of the, the medicine here. Um, I want to use it as a toy example. Suppose that actually total cholesterol is made up of HDL and LDL, happy lipids and lousy lipids. Uh, the happy lipids are the ones that have a positive effect on heart disease, and lousy lipids have a negative effect on heart disease. I think if this is the case of what is actually going on, then the causal effect of total cholesterol on heart disease is ambiguous, because if I give you a scoop of total cholesterol, what its effect of heart, on heart disease is depends on the proportion of HDL versus LDL. So the thought is that total cholesterol is over-aggregated. It cannot be described as a cause of heart disease. The correct causes of heart disease would be either LDL or HDL. So it indicates that not everything can be a causal variable, but that there is a correct level of aggregation to, uh, at which we can speak of a causal variable. In contrast, if HDL and LDL had exactly the same, uh, uh, or if, if two types of uh, HDL, uh, like capital HDL and small HDL, had exactly the same effect on heart disease, 
then it seems that, okay, total HDL is a perfectly adequate causal, uh, cause of heart disease. In that case, we can aggregate HDL and, uh, capital HDL and small HDL into total HDL, which is then a cause of heart disease. So if things have exactly the same causal effect, then that suggests that we can aggregate. If they don't, uh, then, then it seems that uh, um, we are, we are uh, um, going to have ambiguous manipulations. We developed a method, together with uh, uh, Christoph Halupka and Pietro Perona, we developed a method to do this type of aggregation, and we, we tested it on climate data to see whether we can uh, recover El Nino as a macro-level climate phenomenon out of just low-level measurement data. So the task was that, as input, just take low-level measurement data and see whether we can appropriately aggregate up without specifying in advance that El Nino is a macro-level description of this sort of uh, uh, um, um, system. And what we found was that we do indeed find a coarsening of the underlying system in an unsupervised manner uh, that corresponds almost exactly to uh, um, the uh, El Nino, or to when El Nino occurred, where we then determined when El Nino occurred by looking at what was historically taken to be a year for El Nino. So we have, I think, at least a proof of concept that we can start talking about causal relations at multiple levels. Um, this ap application to climate science was, a uh, was um, you know, is not yet a contribution to climate science because in that case this is well known in climate science already and we're recovering known results. But we're interested now in doing this sort, same sort of thing for neuroscientific uh, relations. Um, I think this overall question of modeling systems at multiple levels is still a very much an open problem for causal discovery, and I think there's very much to be done. So I want to sum up. I want to suggest to you that rather than looking for definitions of cause and effect, we should think of it more in terms of a kind of axiomatic approach to causation. We have such, uh, 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 while I don't think we have an axiomatization of uh, uh, causality in the sense that we have a, uh, or in a way that we have an axiomatization of probability in the Kolmogorov axioms, I do think we have an account that unifies observation, intervention, and counterfactuals in one mathematical framework. There are many, many causal discovery algorithms now that many people around the world have worked on, and we can scale these. But I also think it's still uh, an area with many, many rich open problems. If you're interested in this sort of thing, here are a few references. Uh, if you're interested and not familiar with this type of material, here are a few references that you could start with. These are introductory. And of course, this work wasn't done alone. As I especially want to highlight R.J. Antonello, who did the work on the zebra fish, and it didn't come for free either. So also thanks to the funding, and thank you very much to you for listening. <laughs>